first of all, welcome to uh, everyone uh, throughout the various time zones. Um, as Nancy said, I'm uh, William Young, I go by dollar. Uh, and this morning, uh, it's morning here in Florida. Uh, and what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna provide a basic introduction for how STPA can be applied to security. Uh, a little bit of a acknowledgement and disclaimer. Uh, first of all, by way of acknowledgements, I'm going to actually be leveraging uh, both Nancy's charts, some of Nancy's charts and examples that she brought up, as well as some of the example uh, that John brought up yesterday related to the thrust reverser controller. So again, acknowledgements to them. And in terms of a disclaimer, uh, the views are mine and mine alone, not the Air Force's, the, the government's, or uh, Syracuse. Perhaps most importantly, uh, what I'm gonna give you in over the next 90 minutes is a very, very abbreviated version of what's normally a 40 plus hour course uh, that we use to teach people how to perform uh, STPA SEC. And I will also echo John's comments that he made yesterday in terms of the objective of the tutorial. This really is not a training class, but rather think of it like a commercial uh, where you're getting an opportunity uh, to gain a little bit of insight and hopefully get you interested in doing a deeper dive. What we're going to cover today, we're going to begin with a little bit of a motivation of why this is applicable, uh, why the uh, model that Nancy created uh, is directly applicable and already having significant impacts in terms of improving security outcomes. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about how we can view security uh, through the system theoretic lens and what some of the implications are for that. After that, we'll move into uh, the system theoretic process analysis for security practicum. Uh, it's, again, it's gonna be very, very brief due to our available time. And so as a result of that, I'm only gonna touch on the three things that are basically additions to STPA uh, that allow us to address uh, aspects of security. Uh, it is the same stamp model that Nancy introduced on Monday. It is the same, uh, all the same things that John uh, taught yesterday and exposed you to yesterday remain consistent. All we're doing is we're adding on these three things, problem framing, uh, which we will use to give us insight into really the security problem and making sure that we uh, are set up to really delve into uh, the impact uh, that um, uh, really, I should say, managing the impact of disruptions, uh, a key concern of security. Then we'll touch very briefly on security scenario development. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm not gonna repeat what John uh, touched on yesterday, but I'm gonna give you some additional uh, insights for security and think of this as touching on uh, functional vulnerabilities. And then where I'm gonna spend the majority of my time on today is really wargaming. And wargaming is how uh, we're going, it's going to give us the ability to touch on threats. Uh, it's really uh, interesting because uh, the biggest critique that I often get is, how can you teach security uh, without talking about threats? And so uh, it's not that you don't need to think about threats, it's just that, uh, it's putting them in the proper context uh, and actually thinking more broadly of about the term threat than is traditionally done. So we're gonna spend a lot of time and specifically, uh, although STPA SEC does not specify the particular wargaming methodology, uh, it's really suitable for all of them uh, that I've seen. And But today we're gonna to focus on how you would apply it uh, using the uh, United States Department of Defense cyber tabletop uh, framework. So we're going to use that as a way to implement STPA SEC. Again, I can't go into all, all the details due to time, but uh, what you're going to see is how those fit together. And then we'll finish up uh, on talking about does it work in the real world, real world? And I've got just a few high level examples of folks that uh, are number one using it, but will uh, have will allow uh, 
us to share and, and show what they're doing. Uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, to my work is that I really can't uh, go into uh, all the different things that are being done. Uh, people are, are much more sensitive about security uh, than they are uh, in many cases uh, safety. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm going to touch on some of the ongoing work and what I'll call STPA Sec 2.0. But really, it's just what are all the things that I'm cooking up in the lab? Uh, this is a the stamp model is extremely powerful, and uh, what I consistently see uh, is that uh, because it's focused on a new because it introduces a new paradigm, uh, it really is. Uh, wide open as far as the applications. Nancy touched a little bit on it Monday of all these different uh, applications of this model and the great results uh, that it's having. And then we'll go ahead and summarize. And uh, one more time, uh, I'm going to use the exact same example that John used yesterday, uh, not only to save time, but I think it also reinforces the idea that uh, the STPA SEC and STPA are absolutely uh, joined. And in fact, uh, the best results uh, tend to be as when safety and security are performed uh, simultaneously or viewing things from a holistic perspective. And what that looks like is uh, in putting the safety experts with the security experts and uh, together and then watching them uh, perform an analysis that actually leads to solutions that are much more powerful uh, together than they are in isolation. Also, I believe one of the questions yesterday that came up in the chat was, uh, what do you do when safety and security are, are conflicting together? Uh, well, yes, they tend to be at tension, but a great way to tackle that is by having the experts from both disciplines work together. Uh, using the same process. And again, the stamp model in STPA gives us the capability to do that. And I think you'll see some of that as I go. So let's talk about the big idea. <clears throat> really, I think uh, the number one thing uh, that uh, generates the need for this approach is uh, if we look at the chart that I have displayed here, across the bottom is the system development life cycle. Uh, which is also the software development cycle, where we begin with the con uh, concept or con ops, then we move to requirements, then we get a design, then we build it, and then we go ahead and operate and maintain it. And what's not shown here at the end would be eventually we're done with it and we retire it. Uh, along the uh, vertical axis, we have those same things with the exception of O&M. But we show the phase uh, that a defect is created. Here, defect, what we're talking about is anything that uh, is going to cause a subsequent problem. So here, what we're talking about is the difference between uh, building the right thing or building the thing right. And so we're going to really, failure to do uh, one or both of those, we're going to count as a defect. And what you see here is that the subsequent, the later, excuse me, the later that you wait to uh, discover the defect after it was created, the more money it costs uh, to correct it. And I think uh, for, for, that's one of those things that I, I think a lot of us intuitively understand. And in fact, we talk about it. It's the fact that uh, we are much more effective <clears throat> if we were able to get in early and uh, do things, do the right thing, earlier versus waiting until later to try to fix it. And this chart just bears it out. There's an article uh, that, I, that I took this from, but I really like how it shows the exponential growth uh, the, later that we, uh, the later we wait. And so associated with those system development life cycle uh, are aspects of traditional security. So out once we've fielded a system and we're operating it, then our general security approach is to patch. If we find things and fix it during construction, then that's typically a bolt-on. If we're able to catch it early uh, and address security and design, then really that's when people have the discussion of baking in that it tends to occur. If we're able to get 
earlier than uh, baking it in or designing it in uh, and bring security into the requirements. And that's really addressing it through functional security requirements and the inclusion of those requirements. However, uh, one spoiler uh, there, uh, it's often difficult to do that effectively because in order to set a requirement, we have to be able to answer a fundamental question. And that is how secure is secure enough? Uh, we're actually going to talk about that during the uh, presentation today. And I'll show you how STPA, STPA set gives us the capability to at least frame that question. It's a question that can't be answered by a single individual, but rather it has to be agreed upon by the stakeholders. But just uh, setting you, the analysis data from STPA SEC enables us to set up what I like to call a grown up conversation between the senior stakeholders uh, to have that discussion and settle and agree upon how secure secure enough is. And then finally, we can talk about uh, security concepts, which really uh, is the cutting edge work, and that is applying secure system thinking all the way to the concept stage. Uh, when I first began my research, one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, individuals uh, that's very, very experienced in the field, I told them what I, what I was planning to, to work on, and they said, well, it's impossible. You can't possibly begin security with, uh, until you have an architecture. And I said, oh, no, I think this model that Professor Levison has come up with will actually enable us to address security. It won't look the same, and we won't be focused on security of the pieces, but rather we'll be focused on the uh, building a securable concept up front. Uh, a lot of our problems uh, relate to the fact that Early on is when we have the most flexibility in trade space. And if security isn't part of those discussions, then what we often find ourselves is in a situation where the security professionals will come in at the design stage, and, but by that time, all the key trades have been, and there's really no trade space left. So they'll come in or uh, they'll, uh, the great pen testers will come into a security manager or program manager with a stack of vulnerabilities this high, say, here you go, we found it all. But the poor program manager or engineer goes, hey, uh, what do you expect me to do with this? I have no money and no trade space left. And so it's not that folks don't want to do the right thing. It's just the, the dynamics of when we find the problems uh, as, as evidenced by uh, these curves here really ties their hands. So we've got to be able to do better. And as I pointed out a minute ago, really the state of the art is uh, starting at design and maybe a little bit into a requirement. So when people talk about baking and security, that's really what they're talking about. But of course, the design is based on requirements and the requirements are based on your con op. So if your requirements are flawed, wrong, incomplete, then your design uh, is not going to be able to fix those things. Uh, it's kind of like thinking of uh, it's great to bake things in, but if your recipe is all wrong, it's really not going to help you and you're not going to get the meal that you're looking for. So first question, uh, it, uh, in systems that you're familiar with, uh, what was the phase that security was addressed, first addressed? Poll is running, Bill. All right, awesome. Just to confirm with you, yep. We'll let that run for a minute. How's it looking, John? We've got 65 answers, uh, but we've got design for sure is at the top. Okay. All right. I'll end it. Now okay. You, I think everyone can see the results if you submitted something. Okay. So that's, that's about what we expect. But again, the problem with that is that a lot of the cost is that even if you're getting into design, if there was a problem that originated in ConOps, you're still looking at a hundred X cost to fix it first versus had you been able to catch it in the ConOps. So one of the things that we're going to explore here is how STPA SEC deliberately uh, enables, enables you 
to find and fix those things as early as the con op stage. I know that was one of the, uh, John really focused on uh, his approach yesterday and uh, centered STPA a little bit uh, further downstream. But what I wanna really concentrate on today is that we can actually get in at the concept stage and we're, we're gonna show you how to do that. And that actually makes sense because uh, with the traditional security approaches, uh, it's not until you have a design that you have the details necessary to implement the traditional security approaches. But let's take a look at the model that uh, the uh, most approaches to security are based on and why that might be. So this is a quote from uh, Bruce Schneier, who's an uh, accomplished uh, security uh, expert. Uh, he's over at Harvard now. But what he, uh, about 20 years ago, he wrote this and said uh, he, we really need a way to better model threats against the computer system and under, gain more understanding. The reason for the understanding is, the, or the idea behind it is, that if we have the understanding of how uh, threats will attack our system, then as security engineers, then that tells us uh, what we need to build into to defeat the threats. And to illustrate this concept, uh, he used the example of a safe, of opening a safe. And he built something called an attack tree. And this is uh, on your screen here what an attack tree is. So it begins at the top with the goal, opening the safe. Uh, and, that, and that's important here, I should say, the attacker's goal. And we're gonna come back to, the, to, uh, to why that matters in a minute. And then knowing the attacker's goal, then our job was to think through and brainstorm what are the different ways that the attacker could open the safe at the highest level. So for example, they could pick the lock, okay? That would allow me to open the safe. Uh, you could learn the combination. Uh, you could cut open the safe, or you could hope that it was installed improperly. Associated with each of those top level uh, actions are, you'll see an I or a P. Uh, and this, is, was, uh, this was subsequently expanded on. The I stands for impossible, the P stands for possible. Uh, this is important because an assessment is made as to the likelihood or the, event or the potential of that particular approach being successful. And so uh, one, of the, one of the challenges, of course, is if you're not able to predict uh, accurately, then everything falls apart. Also, as people later expanded upon this uh, and began to add probabilities, uh, the only way to really have it be effective uh, in terms of figuring out what was the most likely attack and then engineer against that was the numbers had to be correct. And while that's great, uh, if you've got a bunch of numbers, lots of historical data to draw upon, it's really tough to figure out, hey, what's the likelihood of someone uh, getting into this brand new system that doesn't even exist yet? And oh, by the way, uh, that syst what's the, uh, what are the tools that an adversary is gonna have 10 years from now when the system actually hits the streets? Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. And so uh, once you have the top level the nodes, then you continue to decompose, that, the, decompose them. So to learn the combo, you can either find it or you could get it from the target. And to get it from the target, the ways you might do it are you could threaten them, blackmail them, eavesdrop, or bribe. But you'll notice at the bottom here, if you're gonna eavesdrop, and you'll notice that there's an and there, then you had to not only listen to the conversation, but you had to also get the target to state the combination. Uh, the combination. So <clears throat> an attack is uh, using the attack tree is by combining these various, these various uh, approaches from the bottom to the top. We're gonna talk, Nancy and John both talked about top down versus bottom up. In this case, you clearly see that uh, the attack tree model is basically a bottom-up methodology. Now, one of the things that's really interesting also about this is if you go back and look at the origin of attack trees, uh, they were actually uh, invented by Schneier when he saw fault trees. And as a result of that, they share the same shortfalls uh, 
as the uh, fault trees. And I won't go into that. Uh, Nancy did an excellent job of covering those on Monday. But suffice it to say that the same limitations that attack, uh, fault trees had for uh, safety, fault trees share, or I'm sorry, attack trees share for security today. So that's very, very important to understand. Uh, and it also goes to the potential power of the STAMP model. That being, if we can think differently about the causes of loss, then it might give us insights in order to develop uh, better approaches and improve our engineering outcomes. And so just like uh, STAMP, was applied to safety. Uh, what my research has done uh, is take that same model, uh, the STPA, and uh, apply it to security. And so in terms of some of the specific shortfalls, um, I'll go back to the, uh, my opening statement about uh, the attacker's goal. Uh, well, that, that's great. However, uh, a safe is a mean to an end within a process. So at the end of the day, uh, our mission is not to keep the safe from uh, being opened uh, in isolation. That might be an important aspect of it, but by starting with and narrowly focusing the problem as keeping the safe from being open, uh, what we do is we miss overall the overall context that might give us uh, really, really interesting and cost-effective ways of preventing the outcome. So in this case, what, we're, what we aren't told and what we don't think about is uh, what is it that's in the safe? Because if there's something in the safe that uh, I can perhaps ensure, then maybe instead of putting it in a safe at all, my most effective uh, approach or my most effective strategy from a mission perspective when viewed within the mission context would just be to buy insurance. I'm not saying that uh, don't put that the safe is not the right answer. But what I am saying is that before jumping to keeping the safe closed as our security problem, uh, we will benefit greatly from understanding the mission context that drove us to the decision of putting things in the safe in the first place. It also, by having that discussion, might give us the capability to limit what we choose to put in the safe based upon what we know uh, is possible. So, to really make progress, what we're going to need is a more powerful model. And that model is a stamp model. And so, with the stamp model, uh, it's going to give us the capability and security to gain access to that early upfront part in the green. And what are the things that we're going to fix? Well, they're here in this call out flawed logic, conflicting goals, poor assumptions, wrong problem, missing requirements, and incomplete requirements. Uh, there is a one of the projects that I'm assisting on, a uh, very, very advanced system, uh, cutting edge, uh, but as they were analyzing, as the team uh, was analyzing the products, uh, they found a number of uh, shortcomings and uh, uh, problems. And what was really interesting was that the list of things they found all fell on this list. Uh, and they were focused, uh, again, cutting edge, really, really advanced uh, uh, system that they're working on uh, using, oh, by the way, using all the latest model-based system engineering tools, uh, but those tools did not give insight into uh, those issues. Which leads me to, to highlight the fact that a lot of, really the majority of our losses aren't, uh, can be really preve prevented uh, or mitigated by doing this type of thinking up front. Uh, why? Because those things in that call out are going to result in attack surface. And so if we can get rid of features and reduce complexity and reduce attack surface, we're going to produce safer, more secure systems. So here's the big idea, the first one. Really, uh, it's the idea of we're going to create secure, we're going to define and create secure functionality and a security concept, and then we're going to build a form to realize that concept. And then the second one is that we're going to focus early on in that green stage about <clears throat> uh, understanding our secure and developing a securable process 
And then we're gonna use that insight at that high level of abstraction focused on the process to figure out the specifics that we need to engineer into our system throughout the life cycle. So we're gonna put another way, we've got our basic control loop, and then we're gonna analyze the mission or business process, and then we're gonna treat that process as the particular controlled process that we care about, and we're gonna apply STPASEC on it to gain insights and improve our engineering. Because again, system theoretic process analysis for security. So we're not gonna analyze components, rather we're gonna focus on behavior and specifically process behavior to figure out what right looks like and then use those insights to then engineer a form to implement the securable functionality that we've identified. So this is what we need to get to. So we're going to try, we're going to work hard to get those security principles uh, that today are limited to a tactical level in the hands of our security professionals, which, oh, by the way, there really aren't enough of. Uh, so what we really have to do is what I call deputize every engineer as a security engineer. Uh, and that doesn't remove the need for good, uh, good security engineers. But what it does do is uh, give the, provide the opportunity for uh, the security engineers to focus on the more uh, complex issues versus taking care of what I would call blocking and tackling. So simple engineering mistakes that have security implications that are being made by engineers because they just don't know. So if we can apply these principles via STPS, STPA SEC, then what it gives us the ability to do is maximize the time uh, and uh, 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 the uh, ability of our security folks so that they're working on the high end things, uh, not taking care of the, uh, the lower, th lower level things, uh, simple mistakes that could have been caught by any engineer. So we're gonna talk about secure system analysis. And this is a quote back from Rand. Uh, and where that fits is you've got all of system engineering of which system analysis is a subset and so is system engineer, security engineering. And so what we're really talking about here is secure system analysis is the intersection of system analysis and security engineering. And STPASEC is gonna help us apply that. Again, problem of choice matters, and we're gonna talk about that here in just a moment. So now let's look quickly through uh, security through a system theoretic lens. So we've got, uh, three types of security analysis. There's the threat analysis, which focuses on threats uh, to the system uh, business mission. Then we've got vulnerability analysis. And what's interesting is that typically threat analysis, it tends to be the thing that we spend the most effort on. And then we, then we spend some effort on vulnerability analysis. But what's really important here is that despite uh, Vulner, uh, the presence of vulnerabilities, uh, not all of them can be accessed by a particular threat. So all of these threat cases out here that can't access a particular vulnerability uh, are limited in their value to uh, support good engineering. But what we typically don't talk at all about are very little uh, because those are the two primarily uh, focus of all cybersecurity analysis is really the impact. And what's, what's great here is that impact is actually the thing that we have most control over. Uh, and that is impact on our business or mission operations. How do we do that? Well, it comes back to that green area in terms of how we conceive the processes that our systems that we build will implement to achieve our goals. So that's the most important one. And that's really what we're gonna focus on. It's also important to make a different distinction between tactics and strategy. So uh, the lower level uh, threat analysis uh, really tends to be issues of tactics. And don't get me wrong, uh, tactics are very important, but tactics without strategy are a recipe for disaster. So what we're going to do is we're going to complement our tactics with strategy. And that strategy is gonna be enabled through our STPA set. And 
consistently looking through things through a business or mission lens is going to raise this uh, framework and help us think big picture force. Again, uh, Nancy talked about on Monday, the value of being able to think at that system level, at that higher level of abstraction, and then gradually work your way down uh, and as you uh, implement the details. And it's also important to note that the attack tree really only covers two of those three concerns. You've got the threat attacks, which I showed you earlier, are these paths, sometimes called attack paths. And then you've got the system vulnerabilities, which really are those top, uh, top levels. But what's not discussed and what's not included is the impact to the mission. Not opening the safe, which is the attacker goal, but what's the mission impact if the safe is open? And that's the thing we wanna start with. And then once we start with that, then we might be able to alleviate whole classes of attacks. And we're gonna talk about that. And again, it's, it's the mission impact, not the system impact that ultimately matters the most. And I mentioned this a minute ago, people will say uh, risk is threat and vulnerability and impact, but really the thing we spend the most of our, uh, the vast majority of our resources on is threats, which really provides us very little leverage uh, compared to the other two. Vulnerabilities are a little bit better. I mean, we build the system. So in theory, uh, we create the vulner most of the vulnerabilities. Of course, adversaries have the capability to create some. Uh, so it's, it's not quite as expensive uh, and it gives us a little bit more leverage. But again, what we really want to focus on and what's the most powerful is, is going after that uh, impact, which for a relatively small investment made up front, think back to my chart on the, on the green, we get a bunch of leverage. So that's what we're going to go after. I, I like showing this chart uh, to kind of bridge the gap between safety and security. And this is from Martin Lebicki, who's uh, a researcher over at RAN, and I'll let you read that. So both safety and security uh, through a, uh, when you think of them from a systems perspective, it really is all about preventing system misbehavior. Uh, and so the stamp models focus on control and being able to control system behavior uh, is very much applicable in this perspective to both safety and security. It also gives us the capability to address things whether the bad commands were deliberate or inadvertent. At the end of the day, I don't care. I just want to make sure that I don't suffer the unacceptable loss as a result of those. So let's, let's do something by way of a little bit of a review on STAMP, but it'll also help us uh, draw the connection between safety and security and put a finer point on that. So this is our control loop. Again, we have some controlled process. We have a controller that's taking action to ensure that the process is continuing its goal-seeking behavior on the basis of beliefs that it's updating uh, through feedback of what's going on in the process. So this is a thrust reverser. And the role of the thrust reverser, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with aviation, uh, is to deploy. And then as power, once the deploy, once the aircraft lands, uh, the pilot increases power and then it allows it to slow down and uh, stop on a shorter runway. Problem at, with a uh, thrust reverser is that it can, if it's deployed under the wrong circumstances, say in the air, then it can lead to a uh, accident as Nancy discussed on Monday, if it's deployed or if it doesn't deploy on the ground, then it can also lead to an accident because the pilot is expecting to slow down and is unable to. And so 
uh, returning to uh, the, the Warsaw accident that uh, Nancy briefed on Monday. Uh, so we have the hazard, the system hazard was the aircraft doesn't decelerate on landing. Well, the control action is that the thrust reverser controller, TRC, deploys the thrust reversers too late. But why might that happen when the pilot's applying the thrust reversers after the aircraft has landed? And the pilot believes that the aircraft has landed, but the automation believed that it has not landed. And the reason why is based on the feedback. So automation, you have to tell it uh, when, when we want to consider ourselves having landed. So in this case, the engineer said, okay, well, a good way to know we're landing is the wheel speed above a, uh, a certain rate and the weight on wheels above a certain amount. Okay, so that's how the automation knows, but how does the pilot know? Well, the pilot's got the senses of, okay, I felt myself hit the ground. All right, we must have landed. So the pilot's taking actions and the automation's taking actions, but we're not getting the result that we looked for. Why? Because there's a wet runway and a crosswind landing. So the wheels aren't, even though the plane has landed, the wheels aren't spinning. And because it's a crosswind landing and one side is touching down first, uh, the weight on wheels isn't what it normally would be. So question for you is, could this be caused by an adversary? So hold that thought. And I'm gonna introduce something called stride. I, I constantly get asked this, how does stride fit into uh, are you using stride? Uh, how could stride fit together? Uh, probably not unlike uh, some of the questions Nancy and John get with respect to safety. So stride is, an, is a mnemonic uh, that helps uh, brainstorm potential attacks. And I've listed those here. Uh, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privilege. So, but we're not gonna use stride to generate our scenarios. We are going to use STPA SEC. I introduced stride for two things. Number one, we can use it to categorize the attacks that we develop through our STPA SEC. And we can also use it as a bridge to communicate the results of those attacks to the security engineers that actually have to implement the solutions. So let's come back and, and uh, use the example. And John, if you'll open up the polls again for me. So feedback indicates the plane has not landed. What class of attack might that be uh, shared with? The poll is running while we're awesome. getting responses. Good. You, can go, you can go to the chat window for uh, a link. And if you're not able to see the chat window, go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and just use event code STPA, and that'll get you there. You have to enter an answer to see the results. It looks like the number one result so far is spoofing. All right. There are answers that say denial of service. Tampering is on there. Yeah. Repudiation is on there. Okay. And this is where if we were in a classroom, it would be great to ask people what they were, uh, how people conceived of it and what they were thinking and what was associated with that. Uh, this is actually a, a really, uh, one of the advantages of, of STXEC. Uh, is that discussion that you're able to generate and the insight that you're able to gain, especially early on, because the system doesn't really exist yet. And so the more we can bring together a multidisciplinary team to understand different ways of viewing it, the better insights we get, which those better insights provide for uh, better logic. Again, flawed logic was one of our early on problems that's gonna cost us in the design stage. Uh, and we're able to address all the other things. So I'm actually going to, we can go through all of these, but not for the sake of time, uh, we could go, we, uh, we have got all of them, but the bottom line that I want you to take away from this is that uh, using the exact same scenario that Nancy presented, a safety-based scenario, uh, we could use that 
uh, exactly as is to begin to address security concerns as evidenced by the fact that the things that she brought up and her example on Monday directly tie back to classes of attack that are captured by, by Stride. Now, why, so someone will ask, well, why don't I just use Stride? Well, one of the most uh, compelling answers, in my opinion, to that, especially early on, is the fact that if I were to pick tamper, uh, then I would likely generate uh, one tamper scenario uh, for this entire uh, case that Nancy brought up. But as you can see, there's multiple places that tamper uh, can play out. If I only pick one for tamper and say, okay, I've done tamper, then look how much, look how much I've potentially missed. Whereas if I use an STPA, STPA sec approach, I get the tamper, but I get so much more. To me, this is act, this actually captures uh, the example that uh, the chart that Nancy had on Monday that shows that for safety, STPA catches all the things that you traditionally catch using the normal approaches and so many other, uh, so much more. Uh, likewise with security, you're gonna catch all the things that you would normally catch with the things like stride mnemo uh, mnemonic or attack trees, but again, uh, so much more. So let's move on. All right, so let's talk about STPA SEC. Uh, again, a bit of a review. Uh, John used a similar chart yesterday. Uh, the foundation is the stamp model uh, that provides our model, our way of thinking about things. And once we have that, then we can build a tool analysis tools to implement the model to actually get engineering results. So that would be STPA. And then on top of STPA, is STPA SEC. And over to the right there, uh, I have in red uh, the things that STPA SEC adds. So it adds the problem framing. Uh, you might have a few more. Uh, instead of unsecure and unsafe control actions, when I, I, will, I will call them hazardous control actions <clears throat> because hazardous can be unsafe and, uh, and or unsecure. And it just gives me a bigger term, uh, a bigger umbrella to put them both under. Uh, you'll have the security related causal scenarios and the war gaming. And we're going to touch on each of those. Again, I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to go quickly because what I really want to get to is the war gaming because that's the thing that I haven't been able to spend the most time on in the past that I really wanted to hit that this year. So we are returning back to our friendly uh, air refueling uh, case, uh, boom. And so we start our analysis. Uh, Again, it's the same uh, process as laid out in the SDPA handbook. And the only thing is we're going to add to that problem framing. So that's, uh, we're gonna add that up front, by the way. So let's talk about problem framing. Uh, why do we need problem framing? Uh, well, the simple answer is, is uh, I think we're telling Weber a great paper. Uh, I think every engineer should read it. Uh, it's old, but it's very, very powerful, and it introduces the idea of wicked problems. And I think the, um, it doesn't take long uh, just looking at the challenges that we're facing with respect to security engineering to know that what we're really dealing with is wicked problems. Uh, and again, one of the hardest things about a wicked problem is that just defining the problem is problematic. So if, when you think about things like uh, security, and uh, it'd be interesting to take a poll and see how many of the security engineers have heard this. Yeah, yeah, yeah just secure my system. Okay, sir, ma'am, uh, secure against what, at what cost, for how long, all those are critical mission details that without those, I can't really answer the question of how good is good enough or even what is it that you mean by the term security? Uh, standards sometimes can help, but also the interpretation of standards in many cases can add even more confusion. Uh, people will assume that, well, yeah, I'm just using the standard or I'm, I'm saying the word, so therefore everyone must know what I mean. Well, that, that's not actually the case. Uh, 
And so to make progress, uh, another category, another quality of a wicked problem is that you can't solve. Uh, we will never build a perfectly secure system. Uh, and so uh, does that mean we give up? Absolutely not. But what it does mean is that we need to have what I call grown up discussions up front and clearly set expectations among all the stakeholders uh, about what it is we can and can't do. <clears throat> and if we can't do something, uh, at a given price, then we need to be, uh, we need to, to really uh, think hard about whether or not uh, we need to uh, take that on. Uh, and I'll talk towards the end about uh, one of the ways that this gets manifest is in features or functionality. Um, if we are unable to secure, I, I like to talk about sharks with laser beams. Uh, so the uh, senior sponsors. I want sharks with laser beams. Sir, ma'am, uh, you can't afford sharks with laser beam. Or if I build sharks, with, if I build you, if I try to build you sharks with laser beams, uh, number one, how do you need it for your mission? Well, no, sharks with laser beams is cool. Okay, but uh, let's have a discussion about what it is you're trying to do, because you may not need sharks with laser beams. Dolphins might be good enough for you. Um, you know, obviously facetious here, but uh, the idea is to first figure out what it is that you need to accomplish your mission. That's why focusing on the mission up front is so important. And the way we do that, again, is through this problem framing. And I've got a couple examples here in a minute of when it's done right, what it actually gets you. Uh, so again, back to Bruce, Bruce Schneier uh, and what he says, about uh, problem framing, uh, specific, or specifically this notion of security being a wicked problem. Uh, and that's a direct quote from, from one of his books. And I like how, how he draws the fact that it's not just the technology, it's not just the policy, but it's the interaction between the two. Uh, the politics and the economics and the sociology. Well, think about traditional uh, security engineering. What do we focus on? We focus on the technology. What about all those other things? If you go back to Monday and when Nancy talked about the power of the stamp model in her chart that had the entire socio-technical system structure, there was government, there were all the things that she included there are uh, on her chart, uh, it's also in her book, are the things that are included here by Schneier. So yes, yeah, securities, but also, uh, Ross Anderson, again, another uh, highly respected global uh, expert on security engineering. In fact, that was the title of his book. Uh, these are specific problem framing challenges in security. Life cycle security concepts, kind of important to get that uh, established up front when you're developing your overall concept of operations. What are your security objectives? Not just specifying them, but, but defining them and then relating that back to the mission. Defining that security requirements, of course, but as I mentioned in my introduction, if you don't have the objectives right or the concept right, you're not gonna be able to get the requirements right. And then finally determine measures of success. And to put, again, a finer point on that, uh, his, his quote, uh, many systems fail because their designers protect the wrong things or protect the right things in the wrong way. Without framing the problem, there is no way to catch that. And if that is wrong, again, going back to my first chart about the exponential growth and cost to fix things subsequently in the system design life cycle, if you miss these, then you may never be able to fix them by the time traditional security starts, which is in the design stage. So a couple of success stories of when this is done right, because one of the things that, um, that when I talk about this, uh, people will say, well, yeah, but why? This seems kind of hard and kind of squishy. Why should I do it? Well, here's the answer. Two, again, real world examples. Uh, there was a program office that used the problem framing of STPA SEC. Uh, they were doing a service life extension on one of their uh, devices. And uh, they had multiple stakeholders from different major commands. And they did this to really figure out, hey, what was the mission of this device uh, or the prob security problem associated with this device tied to the, or tied to the uh, overall functionality? 
or, or that process. And then uh, they use that insight to actually limiting functionality and getting rid of features. Uh, and when the uh, stakeholders uh, and sponsors got angry and said, no, I want, again, I want sharks with laser beams, uh, because they had done their homework, they were able to say, okay, show me where that is on your mission. And they were able to win uh, that argument. A uh, couple of points there also is uh, they did it without probabilities. Uh, they did it on the basis of logic and evidence uh, based on the act, all of leveraging the artifacts they had available and taking all that and boiling it down into a mission statement or a problem statement that captured what it is the device was supposed to do. I, I talked earlier about this idea of being able to capture secure functionality and then compare that to a particular form. That's exactly what that is. And then the, uh, uh, again, a major billion dollar uh, program office I uh, used this problem framing to gain uh, sponsor approval to remove features. So they, again, a very, very complex system. Uh, they were able to do this. And what they found, again, those flaws that up front, they were able to come back and go, ah, actually, we think you're asking us to build this into the system. And we don't think it needs it for the mission. And well, yeah, they, they went back and forth but they were actually able to get the sponsor to agree with them and remove those features. How does that tie back to security? Those were features that provided zero value to the mission, but would have represented enormous attack surface. The, the only time to get those removed is in that concept stage. And using this approach, they were able to do that. What does it look like? Well, again, uh, we're synthesizing a concise statement that describes what the system's supposed to do. Uh, it involves uh, pulling out the purpose method goals and lots of talking with the stakeholders and reviewing all their documents. And at the end, they're able to craft a description of a functional model in the form of system to do what, which is the purpose, by means of how, which is the method, in order to contribute to why, which are the goals. And really that's a high level set of activities that represent and capture the essential tasks or activities. Or put another way, what they basically do is create that high level process that we then take and analyze through STPA SEC to figure out how we're going to secure it. And then we take that insight and then use that to guide the development and the implementation of the actual system. Uh, when I talk about this, I like to think in terms of a problem space and a solution space. And so really, the, what this is doing is helping us work in the problem space. And when we talk about architecture, what we're really doing is we're working in the solution space. And so, but we're using what we learned about the problem to define the architecture. And we go back and forth in a sort of weave as we get greater and greater detail as we advance across the system development life cycle. So an example from the load alleviation system uh, might be something like this. A system to reduce structural loading on boom and inadvertent disconnects by means of measuring loads, calculating corrections, adjusting boom position and movement in order to contribute to faster cycle times. That means the ability to get multiple aircraft across the boom uh, in a fixed amount of time and get them gas so they can get back into the fight and lower operating costs. And I also include constraints and restraints uh, while maximizing system autonomy and maintaining safety of flight. And so uh, what I can't capture through, I can show this to you, but until you've actually done this, uh, what I can't capture is the richness of the discussion uh, as different people do bring different perspectives to bear in order to capture this and build this. Uh, very, very insightful in terms of an exercise that helps you catch things like gaps in logic. It'll help you catch missing feedback. It'll also help uh, feed that discussion with senior stakeholders to really figure out what is it that you're trying to do. Uh, one other war story from this, uh, my, uh, myself and another colleague uh, were called in to uh, work on a very expensive uh, pro uh, project uh, in the government. And uh, people will tell me, well, you know, there's no way any decent system can do this. I said, okay, well, we were called in on a Wednesday. 
uh, we got there and we were going to run the STPA sick methodology. And of course, this is the first part of it. And uh, we'll call this system Bob. And I wrote on the board, you know, Bob, exactly what it says here. Bob is a system to do, you know, what question mark by means of question mark in order to contribute to question mark. And they, oh, they yelled back and forth at us. And uh, Friday afternoon, they, tell, they told us to get out and don't come back. Uh, that project was subsequently, uh, I think it's gone through two major restructuring. Uh, but the big, uh, big, big idea here is that they've lost uh, probably in the, you know, ten, definitely tens of millions of dollars um, because they didn't do this and couldn't do this. And what's interesting is they had lots of architectural documents. Uh, and we said, great, that's what you're planning to build. I don't care what you're planning to build yet. I'm trying to understand the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, so, so I guess two examples of good and, and one bad. Uh, so we'd have that. And again, that's just representative. And then you continue along the process. So these are just the same things that uh, John developed yesterday. But let's ask this as another poll question. <clears throat> what are some, are there any specifics or any security specific losses that you might think of? Yeah, I just need one second to open that one. There we go. And we'll give it a minute. How are we coming? Our top, our top result right now is data, and we've also got information and loss of information right up there at the top. All right, there we go. Yeah, you guys are thinking. There you go. Loss of protected, of critical protected information. Now that's something that wouldn't necessarily fall into uh, a safety loss under the traditional definition of safety. However, if you were listening to Nancy's definition of uh, safety, uh, it would definitely fall into her broader definition of uh, safety that she presented on Monday. All right, how about hazards? What would be the hazard associated with the loss of critical protected information? Can you open that one up, John? There we go. Cool. All right, we'll take a minute on that one. Okay, what's our top getter so far? How about something like that? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. <clears throat> and we've got, again, the control structure. I'm using John's control structure from yesterday. No changes there. You would build it exactly the same way. And then we would identify unsafe, unsecure, or hazardous control actions. Again, exactly the same way. I'm not gonna repeat that. We'd use uh, 
uh, the table exactly the same way, nothing changes. And John asked this question, is it safety or security or both? Uh, I'm gonna argue that it's both. And then we're gonna look at some scenarios. Very, uh, we're actually really gonna delve into the war gaming now. I'm gonna speed ahead a little bit. So security specific uh, scenarios, just real fast. Uh, <clears throat> here's some of the challenges. I've, I've hit these earlier, uh, lack challenge in, uh, understand the interactions between components. In fact, uh, Adam Shostak on his blog, he's the guy that developed Stride. He, he highlighted the limitations of Stride applied to uh, systems that have multiple interacting components. Uh, he also pointed out the limits of it, uh, applicability to uh, capture non-technical aspects. Uh, one of the things I haven't touched on yet, but it's really important to at least briefly hit upon, is the fact that because you're going bottom up using things like attack trees, you can actually develop scenarios that aren't valued by stakeholders. So let's go back to our uh, attack tree and let's suppose that uh, the role, we aren't putting anything of value, uh, of real significant value that is an unexpected that is an unacceptable loss if taken. So for example, if I'm putting, uh, let's say that I'm putting my, for the, based upon the mission operation, the thing that I'm keeping in the safe, I'd like to keep uh, the door closed. Uh, let's say it's got my social security number in it. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, if it's gonna cost me a lot of money uh, to, to build, to try to build an impregnable safe, when the loss that I occur uh, when the safe is open or the loss that I'm concerned about is exposure of my social security number, it might just be cheaper to buy insurance. So you develop this elaborate, a bunch of elaborate scenarios to get the safe door open, but then I go, yeah, but I don't care that much. Or yeah, I'd like it, but I don't care that much. And so you end up wasting all this effort building these beautiful scenarios, uh, but the stakeholder goes, yeah, I don't, that's not what I care about. Um, STPA, STPA set get around that because what we ask at up front rather than at the end because we work top down is what are the things that you care about? What are your unacceptable losses? And those unacceptable losses are outcomes that are absolutely domain agnostic. Everyone can understand, uh, hey, look, I don't, want to, I don't want to kill anybody or, hey, look, I don't want my jet to crash. Um, all right, those, or as a commander, I don't want my mission to fail. Okay, yeah. Now, the technical um, uh, engineering required to assure my mission so it doesn't fail. I may not know all the technical details, uh, all the tactical technical details. Uh, that's where I'm going to use my intent to specify the problem to be solved. I'm going to give you the why and, the, and uh, talk about the what but really it's up to the tactical technical experts to give me the best how. And that's really the benefit of working from top down. Uh, we do that in the military with things like commander's intent. And arguably what we really should be doing with engineering is the engineer, I call it the engineering equivalent of commander's intent um, because that would give us a, a nice structured top down approach to actually get after some of these things, especially with respect to security. <clears throat> Uh, some best practices, again, I mentioned this, is to have safety and security experts together generating the scenarios. Uh, we mentioned that uh, we'll get more scenarios and the scenarios will have more complexity. Uh, again, we're or we will hit those functional vulnerabilities and uh, tools we're gonna use the, if a security team is unable to work with the safety team, then we'll use the STPA analysis if it's available and we'll also use the formal STPA that John touched on. Uh, I, I will use Stride to classify attacks and translate results. One of the benefits is that if I can identify a class of attack uh, based on the scenario and then tell a security and come up with a approach that gets rid of a whole class of attacks, then that makes my job much, much easier. All right, so uh, we, let's do this. Uh, let me just point this out that uh, and this is important, and we'll see more of this when we get into war gaming. To launch a successful cyber attack, the adversary has to serve, solve their own control problem. Uh, so uh, you now can take the, 
Nancy's uh, stamp model and what everything that you learned from the uh, basic STPA. And then you just use that to figure out what an adversary would have to know in terms of feedback and control actions in order to successfully implement their attack. And so now I want to hit that in the war gaming. Uh, all right, so history of war gaming, uh, that's uh, Von Moltke the Elder. Uh, lots of rich uh, history on the value of war gaming, which is why it's been brought into security. Uh, it's going to give us the, it's, it will bring a human adversary into the process. As I mentioned earlier, that's the one thing that people tend to say, well, you know, that's safety, difference between safety and security is that, you know, security has a, you know, a sentient uh, adversary. And to that, I typically reply, yes, but um, your, uh, if you come up with a, even well-intentioned people, uh, if you've developed a horrible uh, system with horrible pressures, they're, they're well-intentioned workarounds uh, that they require to execute their mission can actually create those hazardous control actions. So um, I think you have to kind of be careful about using uh, smart people as the, as the differentiator between safety and security. Um, so yeah. All right, so here's how we're going to do it. Uh, last uh, 30 minutes, we're going we're gonna to use everything we've done. We're going to start at the concept stage. Uh, we're going to use uh, classes of attacks. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the uh, effectiveness of class of controls. And it's going to let us uh, understand how hard it would be to actually implement an attack from a holistic perspective but we can use all this to actually have much richer discussions about operational risk. Uh, here's the basic approach, the blue team, those hazardous control actions and scenarios that you've already identified. We're gonna now pull those in along with what the blue team thinks is a good countermeasure or controls. And then, then the red team or the opposing force is going to take that exact same scenario. So both blue and red have the exact same uh, scenario and hazardous control actions. And then red's going to try to implement it. And then they're going to evaluate the attack and see how well the control worked. That's really the, uh, the goal of this. And then also figure out how costly it was. Costly the attack, how complex was it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And as I mentioned, we can do this with the, uh, any methodology that you prefer, but let's look at how it applied to the DOD cyber tabletop. So this is all from the uh, uh, DOD cyber uh, tabletop version 1.0. You can Google it uh, and get that. And what we're specifically talking about is uh, the low, what they call low fidelity or things before the first uh, milestone. But you can use it at any point in the process. So let's look at what it would look like. So this is a depiction of the cyber tabletop says, hey, you've got to identify the subsystem under analysis in the cyber tabletop. Uh, this is their depiction in the guidebook. And so we're going to use this, but instead, oops, we're going to say, all right, so as opposed to picking uh, a, a random uh, subsystem or uh, the whole platform, which we could do, uh, for our subsystem, we're going to use what we've already got. And that was the boom. So we're going to assume that this depiction is of our, of our uh, 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 tanker. And so, hey, look what we've already got. Rather than using a cartoon uh, or an OV-1 that doesn't really give you a lot of insight, we've already, through the process of our STPA, STPA sec analysis, we've already generated a lot of information that we can now bring into our tabletop to make that a much richer tabletop than might otherwise uh, be possible. Also, the uh, DOD cyber tabletop says, hey, you're supposed to use all these various artifacts. Uh, well, in generating our uh, control structure, guess what we used? All the artifacts that the DOD cyber tabletop recommends that you use. This is just a process to do it that, and so it fits very, very neatly. All right. So also, the control structure has a lot more detail uh, than would typically be available if all we used was try to conduct the cyber tabletop using an OV-1, which is just a basic cartoon 
uh, similar to what you see there. Uh, we have a lot richer uh, model that we can now take advantage of. And by having that richer model, uh, which, oh, by the way, has direct traceability back to the mission, we are very well set up to get some great results from this. This is the tabletop process. Uh, OP4 is the red team, stands for opposing force. So they describe the class of attack. Then both uh, teams describe the outcomes and system effects. Then the op, op, uh, operational team, that's the blue team, describe the mission impact and workarounds. And then they interact to the next broad class of attacks and then OP4 and you go round and round until you're done, all right? So let's show how we would do that. Again, we're, we're going to use what we generated yesterday for safety uh, to show this. So here is, this is what we did yesterday. So you already have this. So you can imagine yourself just going in and pulling that off and say, hey, we've got all of our uh, scenarios broken down from one to N. John showed you yesterday how to do that. So let's just pick one. So in this case, BCU, which is Boom Control Unit, provides excessive movement command when Boom is in contact because BCU believes Boom is not in contact due to delayed pulse feedback. Uh, so you did that yesterday. So now let's use that as the input into our cyber tabletop or our war game. So that's the scenario. First question, what are the relevant effects of a successful attack on the subsystem under analysis, which in this case is the BCU. Again, step one, got to describe the broad, broad class of attack and goal. So John, would you open a poll for me? Got it, it's open. Yes. So again, you've, you've already done the work. Now you're just taking the work and you're applying it, but this is also really helpful because perhaps uh, you're a major contractor that's got to do the DOD cyber tabletop or is using the DOD cyber tabletop to support uh, and provide artifacts that the Air Force will use or the authorizing official will use uh, to support a decision. We've got lots of responses, Bill. Um, now in the polling, when you've got multiple word answers, it's difficult to see uh, what the most common response is, what the theme is without looking for a minute. So I can, I can just see individual answers on this poll. Um, but we've got uh, answers like damage to the aircraft, damage is coming up all over the place, um, loss of the receiving aircraft or the tanker aircraft, boom damage, uh, refueling mission is not successful and things to that effect. Okay. So this, it's, this is good, but actually we can be more specific than damage to the aircraft. And that's one of the things, and you've already done the work to help you answer the question more precisely. That for this specific case, what we're concerned about is delayed pulse feedback, because we know that if that feedback is delayed, then it can lead to the boom control unit providing excessive command movement when the boom is in contact, which can cause a hazard, which leads directly to one, to one of the unacceptable losses. So you, yes, it does cause, it does put the mission at risk, but you can be more specific because you just by using the traceability, you already have the capability to answer the question. And it's right here. And it's all based upon leveraging the work that you've already done through your STPA, STPA SEC analysis. So it gives you insight into also into broad classes of potential attacks. Let's see how we can take that and gain some insight into, okay, so what broad classes of attack might bring this about using what we've already done? So this is this, our control structure that we've already built. Again, I'm just bringing that over. So what elements does that attack impact? Go ahead and open up another uh, window for me, John. Yep, it's running. Perfect. One of the benefits, you, uh, go ahead, John. 
Uh, I just wanted to ask you uh, to clarify for folks, you're looking for elements on the screen now, right? Yes, yes, you've already done the work. This is what you have available. One of the rules of the way this is played using uh, with, with STPA when you do this is you have to use what you have available. So you don't get to arbitrarily go several levels of detail and say, hey, I'm gonna use this specific type of exploit against, because well, we haven't designed that yet. One of the key purposes of doing this now early is to figure out and support good design choices. Hey, Bill, quick follow-up question. Yeah. When you say element on this screen, do you mean just the boxes or are you talking about the arrows as well? Yes, everything on there is, is fair right. game. Yes, exactly. Just wanted to clarify for folks. A lot of folks might have thought you meant just the boxes. Nope. nope. All right, so we've got some... The arrows are feedback going, the arrows up are feedback, the arrows going down to control actions. And this is really good also because if we were, if we had a fully developed tanker boom control system, we would have pages and pages and pages and pages of data flow diagrams that we would then have to take and try to figure out what connects to what. Uh, I, you know, all the gazentas and gazatas. Uh, Great. You don't understand the context. Whereas now with this, you understand the high level context. And so for example, boom force sensors, that might be, you know, 10 different things. But if we can figure out the functional effect or that it doesn't matter, then I don't have to worry about that actual implementation detail. We're staying at the high level, and then we're going to use our insights to figure out where to deep dive. So we've got 150 answers now, and they changed quite a bit as we were talking. Originally, people right. were uh, saying boom, uh, almost everyone did. And then as you were talking, they started to get a different answer. And they said, yes. well, what about the, that feedback going from the yes. boom control unit? And people are even going further than that, say, well, down the line, it's going to affect a control action. But uh, yes. I think people have picked up on it. Yep. Yes, the delayed feedback pulse. So look at this. Where does that, again, don't, you, this is a very structured approach and you've already, you're using, you're taking advantage of the things that you've already done to gain more insight. And again, we're, we haven't gone deeper. We're working at the same level of abstraction, but we're learning a whole lot more than we might otherwise learn if we just kind of threw out random stuff. There we go. There's one answer. Delayed pulse, P, uh, delayed pulse feedback. Obviously, that's going to be one thing is the boom contact sensor because that's where that's occurring. But is there another that you can find? So I'll let everybody think because there's at least one more. about that so what if the delay what if the sensor is working fine but there's a but the uh, process of the uh, pulse feedback is delayed now there's any number of reasons that could cause that um, but the idea is to narrow down and focus on uh, how it could occur again at the level of abstraction that we're working with using the information that we had available. And then we really want to deep dive into that because unlike having, well, again, what's beautiful about this, the system isn't designed yet. What we're doing is we're war gaming and we're doing security engineering at the functional level. And what we're going to do is we're going to come out of this with functional constraints or improve functional constraints that we're then going to hand all the individual people that are building the pieces that guide and constrain their, their, solu their uh, solution spaces. So it's actually gonna help them. It's actually, if you do this at the top level, it's actually gonna help all of your lower level engineers that are gonna implement the details because you're taking, a, because you're constraining them into a solution space that if they implement within that, not only do you know how to tie all the pieces together, but it's gonna be secure. And you did it before rest versus fixing it after. 
And oh, by the way, these are all things that if you had an actual architecture and red teamed it, you would find and it would be a problem, but by then it's too late and you can't fix it. Whereas here you're fixing things proactively. So let's move on. <clears throat> so you've got the element impacted, the effect. Now can we figure out our attack class? So one more, using stride, what broad classes of attack might delay a pulse from getting, might delay the pulse feedback from the boom contact sensor? That. So again, we're using traditional security tools. We're just not using them to generate our scenarios. What we're using them for is to classify our scenarios. And that provides us a direct bridge between this high level and the security folks that have to implement the details. Denial of service and tampering. All right, look at this. We've actually completed the step one for the DOD cyber tabletop. And we could do the same thing for the broom control unit where the effect is delayed processing of broom control sensor pulse. Denial of service. So what's the goal of the attack? There it is right there. Provide excessive movement command when the boom is in contact. But again, it only counts when the boom is in contact, which should bring up a very interesting uh, thought in your mind is, and it, I mentioned this earlier, you still have to, you can still frame this as a control problem. So how is, if someone is writing an exploit, or if someone is, uh, if, and you're gonna trick, what you wanna do is you wanna trigger the exploit or trigger the attack only at the time when it's gonna be the most destructive or the most effective. So here, the BCU providing excessive movement command, hey look, if that happens and there's not another aircraft nearby, uh, then that means that we might be able to fix it. So what you really wanna to do to get the effect is you wanna make sure that the boom is in contact because that means it can injure, uh, damage the other aircraft or potentially disrupt the, uh, the mission. But again, so timing matters with these attacks. But the good thing here is that we actually get a chance to try to do something about it because we can take advantage of, in order to accomplish the attack, what must the adversary know? And because we haven't built the system yet, then we actually can do things to prevent that and make that much, much harder for them to do. So just a, a key, uh, we'll summarize here. These are all the details that we've gotten just from applying STPA SEC results in the DOD uh, cyber tabletop to war game. So we know potential targets, desired effects, goal of the attack, potential attack classes, and the context under which the attack must succeed. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper uh, so it's going to be a richer attack move, but let's dive a little bit deeper into the context. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier. The, the playing rules, uh, control structure, as you've been seeing, is our playing field. Uh, we have to stay at the current level of abstraction uh, because that's all the detail that we have. But we want to milk every bit of insight out of that so that we can use that to inform our next subsequent level of refinement. Assumptions have to be clearly stated and the op four has to adhere uh, to context. So now let's look at context as, a, as an example. So how might the op four determine, we already said that the op four to launch an attack wants to do it when the boom is in contact. Launch their denial of service when the boom is in contact. So what's available, how would they have to, like uh, what information is available to them to figure out how, did, uh, how could they determine the boom is in contact? What do you guys think? John, if you'll open another window for me. The poll is open. All right. So for folks uh, looking for some guidance, you might look again at what's on the screen. 
and look at specific elements here on the screen that uh, that may be um, targeted. Is that about right, Bill? It is. And and if we had full time, uh, if we had our, our full amount of time, then we would, and had we done this in a, a long course, then we would have all the insight that we developed yesterday doing the other pieces are things that would directly uh, leverage here. It's just, again, due to the compressed time, I can't get all the riches. I'm trying to squeeze as much as I can out of this to show you guys how powerful this is. And also someone asked yesterday, how do you do this at the concept stage? What you see here is something is, in fact, we could actually build a control structure even more detailed than this uh, at the concept stage. So it's very much, very applicable and you can get to really, really powerful results. And again, those powerful results are insights that are gonna guide and inform your engineering decisions, your assumptions uh, and rationale, et cetera. So, All right, well, lots of folks are pointing out feedback right there from the yep. boom. You've got yes. that highlighted and a few yes. folks have gone even beyond that. Excellent, how about that one? Again, so think about this. Uh, the boom force sensors, John said yesterday that, um, uh, uh, what is it, uh, five, five tons for a disconnect? Yep. Yeah, so, so all right, so if you, if you had the ability to monitor in the boom control unit, maybe you can't do anything there, but you know contact is gonna be uh, what you should be sensing, the data you should get is that is uh, five tons and you're monitoring that, okay, that might be enough to say, now I can launch the attack because I know I'm in contact base, not upon this feedback data, but this feedback data that's present in the state or context that I care about. All that's available to you, you've already figured all that out, you just gotta leverage it. How about something even more exotic? you might be able to get it from the boom operator. Why? Because the boom operator is going to actuate the mode toggle command based upon whether or not you're in contact. Okay, so maybe you can't monitor this and can't monitor this, but you can monitor this. But then you might also be able to get it from this, the 3D position. So what we're doing here is we're looking at our control structure and figuring out, okay, how might an adversary leverage feedback data to understand the context and know they're in the context to launch the attack? In this case, like I said, we've already defined the denial of service attack. And we can expand it even more and we can look across the entire uh, system and mission. Just pulling in things that you've already done and we're leveraging those to accomplish the purpose that we're, we're trying to, to, uh, to do. So, uh, <clears throat> almost out of time here, so I'll just wrap up. Uh, phase three, uh, mission effects and identify workarounds. Uh, you're now well positioned. It's just an extension on your scenario development. You've got uh, broad classes that mirror safety. You can mitigate, eliminate or transfer or accept all of those. And we, will have, we would have just walked through uh, denial of service. And then our next step for four, iterate the next class of attack. You've already identified it. It's now we go through the same thing with tampering. All right, so final thoughts, uh, <clears throat> capture the results. Uh, this is, I talked about the power of this in refuting those faulty assumptions, flawed logic. Really all those things that I identified in that very first chart that say, these are the problems that tend to drive up costs. At the very end, it gives you the capability to another means to address those. All right. And so, uh, all right, so it doesn't work in the real world and we'll close out. So this is from uh, Akamai. Uh, Andy Ellis is their ch uh, chief information security officer, uh, phenomenal American. Uh, and he is one of the really early adopters of this and has been pushing it uh, uh, within Akamai for years. IT Alliance for Public Sector Cybersecurity. Someone I think asked yesterday in the chat window about applicable to IT. 
Uh, here was an assessment. Embraer has done phenomenal work. This is from one of the presentations made a few years back. This was when they had first initiated uh, getting it in, uh, getting STPA sec into DO3, DO3, uh, 356, uh, that has been completed. It is there now. And the Air Force has a variant of STPA set called function emission analysis. Uh, it's primarily focused on ops and kind of looking at sort of operations. Uh, but this was the results uh, from a sprint. And then finally, what am I cooking up in my lab? Uh, so we're working on, uh, John talked about formal STPA or another name for that is the Thomas method. Uh, we're applying that uh, for security uh, and we're finding that there are uh, a few artifacts that are automatically generated uh, using some MBSE tools that are actually suitable that we can run the Thomas method on. It's not an automated process, but we can use the data contained in the model uh, to support some, some of the aspects of STPA sec, and we think that we can do a little bit better. Uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is, I call it uh, Cyber Hatter. Uh, for those that are unaware, Hatter is a hazardous air traffic report. And the idea is that you can leverage the results of your STPA sec analysis and that good thinking to actually um, identify and address conditions as uh, captured in your logs uh, where, you act, where your system actually entered a hazardous state. Uh, as many of you know, the challenge is that once you have a signature for an adversary and can go backwards, you can say, oh yeah, they've been here for years. You just didn't know what to look for. Well, because you're doing all this upfront thinking, the idea is that you can define uh, the way a hazardous air traffic report it, uh, it occurs is that anytime two aircraft generate minimum safe separation, uh, a hatter is filed. And the idea is that there was some control that was supposed to be there that wasn't. And so even if the aircraft didn't collide, which hopefully they didn't, what you wanna do is every time your system enters a hazardous situation, you wanna go back and figure out why that occurred. And that's how we do it for air traffic. And so the idea is that you could do this for cybersecurity. And the power behind this is that now you force the adversary to be perfect, not just lucky. What do I mean by that? Well, chances are that uh, they've been there before and put your system in a hazardous state. And you may have even had the log data to catch it. You should know how to make sense of it. Well, the idea now is that you're going to consistently catch every hazard. Every time your system enters a hazardous state, it's going to give you the opportunity to go in there and figure out what happened, which now means that they're going to have to be perfect because each time they make the system enter a hazardous state, you've got the opportunity to catch them. Uh, we're also working some support to adversarial machine learning, uh, some graphics, uh, improve support to the uh, risk uh, for those of you that are applied the risk management framework, uh, there's a great integration between STPA SEC. It supports that. And then finally, uh, doing some work on uh, Nancy mentioned uh, being able to take a uh, go from co do co uh, concept and then guide the uh, development of a prototype. Uh, we're working on something where uh, you've already got a prototype. And the idea is uh, what can we figure, can we figure out how to safely use that prototype and what's the risk associated with using it for certain missions. So again, all those things are, are on upcoming and uh, ongoing. Uh, but what I want you to take away from this is really, I think that it, it just scratches the surface of what's possible with the stamp model. Uh, if I had Nancy's charts, I would show you the, the, uh, the little band cartoon. Um, because I think it really is a brand new paradigm. And with the opening of that new paradigm, it's a great opportunity to relook uh, nearly everything we do and I think improve our outcomes, again, based on the power of the model. So 
summarize, uh, use the, uh, I've tried to emphasize this idea of looking through the strategy lens and starting at the concept stage. Uh, we can enhance our security uh, by defining this notion of secure functionality and then build an architecture to implement that. Uh, we talked about how STPA SEC really gives us the capability to address those three things associated with cyber risk. We get after the impact through problem framing, uh, vulnerability or specifically functional vulnerability. We're gonna get at through those additional security specific scenarios. And then finally, we're gonna to touch on threats through war gaming. So parting closing shot from uh, Sunza. I like this one, the one on the bottom especially. Uh, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat.